Uh, yes, hello, good afternoon everyone. I hope you had a, a good lunch and a coffee after that uh, because it's very tricky with um, a jet lag and a good lunch like that. Very tricky periods. Okay, I was going to start with a quiz on your knowledge of the Belgian coast, but as I thought, that would be very, very unfair for a lot of you <laughs> because we have some local people here. Oops, this computer is moving. Um, so, but as probably most of you haven't seen our coast, I just want to go through a quick scan of some pictures of our coast so that at least you know how it looks like a little bit. Um, Probably, you know, you've seen that on the map, hopefully, when uh, you were coming to Belgium, this tiny little country, that we only have uh, 67 kilometers of coast. It's not a lot, but that makes it, that doesn't make it more easy to do uh, integrated coastal management. Uh, we have a little bit of dunes left, not much, 3,600 hectares, but if you look on the border with France. This is the border with France. We have some what we call larger dune complexes. Some people laugh at us if we call these dunes if, uh, large complex because if you see it in real life it's rather small. Um, we have typically for our coast are, are our wide sandy beaches so the tourists really love them. Um, but also another typical thing for our coast you can already see there high-rise buildings. Um, so this is what we call it's we call it the Atlantic Wall because in a lot of places there's just a wall of high-rise apartments and uh, yeah, generally not known as the best quality of our coast. Um, but also this is, so we were at the French border, now this is the, the, with the Dutch border. We also have a big beautiful nature reserve, the Zwin National Park, which is very well, well, well known in Belgium at least. Um, so we have sometimes uh, also dune forests, some of them, very narrow dune areas. And this you might remember, I don't know what time you left this morning and if it was daylight, but uh, this is uh, Ostende. We have a very nice, what we call a promenade, a hiking, walking dike, um, but there's, uh, it's also, of course, coastal defense. Um, Belgium is, especially this part, is very, very flat. Uh, so this is, if you look from the coast, look inland, uh, we have low-lying polders uh, and up until about 20 kilometers inland. Uh, it is um, it's very flat and even below sea level. Um, we have uh, two, um, two harbors on the coast in Ostende, the one we see outside here, and in Zeebrugge, and a couple of marinas. Um, and there you can see our very narrow dune strip that we still have, and also the coastal road. Uh, there is a tram for you, for those of you who would have uh, time, it's seen as a nice tourist attraction to go on the coastal tram, uh, and uh, it gives you a nice view. If you go from one side to the other side, it takes about two and a half hours, so it's it's quite it's a slow means of transport, but it gets you through the whole of the coast, and it uh, gives you nice views on the coast. So. Um, so there's another view where you can see the harbour of Seebrugge in uh, the, the upper left side, uh, the beach uh, and the uh, very flat area behind it. And there is the coastal tram. So, and with this, time seems like a nice thing, but also it's, it's not so nice for the, the coastal ecosystem. We have the tram, but also coastal road that is crossing from one side to the other side of the coast. And of course, it's cutting through the dune area. So it got its advantages, but also its disadvantages. Uh, and I think it's like that with many, many things on the coast. So this was just a quick fly tree through our coast. Um, but let's get down to the real issue of today. Oop. Uh, no, this is me. Okay. Um, so let me uh, first introduce myself now. Um, my name is uh, Cathy Bilpama. I work for the province of West Flanders, which is, uh, well, the provincial government. Uh, Claudia said it's, it's regional. I'm not going to explain I'm not going to explain, and it doesn't matter, <laughs> really. Uh, but we have quite uh, different uh, authority levels in Belgium. So we have municipalities, the, um, it's local. Then you have 
provinces. We have 10 provinces uh, within Flanders. Then you have, uh, sorry, within Belgium. Um, then we have the Flemish level, which is regional, and then the national. So there's four authority levels. I work for the intermediate, um, and we are the only coastal province. So it's that's quite easy. We don't need to talk to the other provinces in our country because we the coast is only belongs to us. That sounds quite strange, but it belongs to us, um, and we're proud of it. Um, I, I am a biologist by training myself. Um, I did my PhD research on uh, ecotoxicology um, with flatfish, uh, but quite soon I uh, moved into more the management side of uh, coastal management, um, and so that's a little bit what I'm going to share with you more, the management side. Um, I have been working in ICZ or ICAM uh, for about 20 years, uh, dealing with a whole variety of issues. It could be oil pollution, it could be marine spatial planning or coastal atlases or um, yeah, you know, seagull uh, prob problems with ex expansion of seagulls and breeding seagulls on, on roofs. Uh, so it's been a very a variety of topics that I've been dealing with. Um, the, the little unit I was working for before even was called the Coordination Centre for Integrated Coastal Zone Management. Um, we are no longer called like that. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on that for the moment, but it might be interesting to look at it later because it describes a bit the, how integration or not integration in collaboration between authority levels works. Um, I will, I will talk more on that if we have time at the end uh, of my presentation. Um, so what this introduction is all about is the first learning uh, outcome for this course. Uh, it's about understanding the fundamental aspects of ICZM, IC, uh, ICAM. Uh, maybe just this difference. Um, in Europe, we used to speak about integrated coastal zone management. In a later phase, the Z was skipped, and now we talk about ICM, so integrated coastal management. And more in the American uh, literature, they talk about ICAM, so integrate, integrated coastal area management. But basically, it is, it is the same. Um, so, is the coast special? I was going to ask this question to you. Uh, and to, to ask you to come up with arguments. But, well, do we actually, some people might say, is this coast special? Do we need special legislation for the coast? Do you need special visions or, I don't know, specific attention for the coast? But I've been listening very carefully to your introductions, uh, which started at 11, and, uh, well, I, I think, I hope, <laughs> that every one of you is sure that the coast is special. Or are there people who say, well, actually, it's just like inland, it's just all the same, we don't need any special attention for the coast? Could be. There were people saying, well, why do you need a minister for the North Sea, or why do you need a minister for the coast? There is no. Is there any country which, who has a minister for the coast? No, we could use one actually, see if you think about it, but we won't had well, and we still have something like a minister for the North Sea um, that takes air, all aspects into account. So putting things in an integrated way instead of a minister for energy and a minister for tourism and a minister for, I don't know, blue economy. But um, so for the coast, we would say, yes, the coast is special. And I'm saying this because of the perspective that also Europe took. Maybe just also to say this, I'm going to talk mainly from a European perspective. I know there are people from many different other uh, parts of the world, um, but I was asked to talk about the European context and that's also what I know best, uh, and about the Belgium situation. Um, but of course, I'm, I'm sure that some of the principles, you will be very easily uh, be able to link it to your own uh, situation at home. Um, so, I'm not going to give you a lot of data and figures here, why the coast is special. I'm sure you will be seeing uh, loads more, more data uh, in the coming days. Uh, but um, 
With my first question asking, is the coast special? It was also recognized by the European Commission and my European Environment Agency that yes, we need special attention for the coast. Um, when I started, started with ICSM, that's about 20 years ago, they also had a special program on mountains. I think um, there, was, there was two programs. There was an integrated mountain management program and an integrated coastal zone management. But I think we're the only one left. I don't think that mountain one is there still. Um, so you can see some figures there. Yes, it is important so in terms of the number, uh, the amount of people that live there, uh, on the economical importance, and also on the well, there is the, the 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 volume of foreign trade that is contacted by the sea. So foreign trade that also uh, immediately implies it's important to see this in an international concept. Um, that. That definition or that consideration was quite an economical one. This is not the best of slides, but this is just a green screenshot by the Oslo, uh, Oslo and Paris Commission, uh, who analysed some issues of uh, coastal zones and did their assessment in 2017, uh, looking at many different aspects that uh, some of you have um, also uh, touched upon, marine protected area, looking at fishing communities, um, looking at contaminant concentrations, marine litter as a problem. Uh, so. If we say coast, there are so many different aspects that are very typical for coasts that you don't have anywhere else. And that's why we really need to think about special, uh, special attention for the coast. Uh, and that's why in um, 1996, the European Commission said, OK, we are going to start with um, a special program for the coast, a demonstration program. Uh, so it's going to be like a little bit of history now. Um, and maybe just to know, uh, because I've seen your presentations, but um, I would like to get a feel on how what long periods some of you have been working into integrated coastal management. Who is very recent between like one zero and one year working on coastal topics? Some people just really recent in the field. Okay, so this history will be very relevant. <laughs> um, people working from one to five years in the field. Okay, five to ten years. Okay, yeah. Any people more than ten years? Oh, I'm technically more. Oh, you're, you're definitely more than you two. So, yeah, it's. So in your part of the world, it will be interesting to see, because I remember in one presentation there was also some mentioning of ICZM strategies, and there was some strategy that was yours in 2011, I thought that was in Israel? But, but oh, Egypt. This is a strategy of Egypt, yes. 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 So, uh, from the 1994. 1994? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, the, the, so you were well ahead of the European Commission there. Yeah. <laughs> But I'm working for, for this is the law of uh, the environment in Egypt. Uh, it was issued in 1994, uh, and it was a sort of uh, integrated coastal zone management in Egypt. But uh, still, we don't have uh, a certain plan for uh, integrated coastal zone management. Okay. Well, I heard that in your introduction you said we don't have a plan yet. Well, that might be a question at the end of my presentations. Do you actually need a plan for it, or is it something else that you need? So. It's just something to think about, but I will continue <laughs> the little history plan of um, how it went in Europe. So we were probably a bit late compared to some other, uh, well, like Egypt, or I also know that in uh, in the US, they were already thinking about ICAM a lot, a lot, lot longer than we did. Um, there were a lot of demonstration projects, 36, it doesn't really matter, this figure, but also thematic studies. They were not only looking at sectors, but also looking how do we need to go about legislation, particip participation of different actors, um, about information. Uh, so you can see them there, the thematic studies were also done in that period and also there was a socioeconomic advantage study, uh, so where they tried to prove that ICZM could be of benefit economically, that you could uh, so you could save money by doing an integrated approach. Um, so again, this is nearly 20 years ago when it finished, and these were the conclusions uh, that 20 years ago. 
the strategic importance of the coast. I think we, we can quite agree with that. Um, the increasing pressure on coastal zones that was set already 20 years ago and the developments that went beyond carrying capacity. I think we've also seen in many of your examples where you show that there is conflict between, for instance, uh, tourism and uh, then the use of the coast or, well, turtles being protected and turtles being eaten. Uh, so what is the carrying capacity of the turtle population? Uh, so I think still today this conclusion is very true. There is a, a huge pressure on coastal zones. And then the underlying problems, uh, they said there was, in coastal management, there was a lack of vision and a limited understanding of coastal processes, an inadequate involvement of stakeholders, an inappropriate and uncoordinated sectoral legislation and policies, policies and then also a lack of uh, the local initiatives that lack support from the higher uh, administrative levels. I would like to invite you to keep these four underlying problems in mind that were identified four years ago and to see at the end of my presentation if something has changed in your minds. And does any one of you, if you would go back in time a little bit, or maybe even today, do you recognize these problems of not having a vision, not enough involvement of stakeholders? I see nothing here. And which one of the four is all of them? All of them? <laughs> Still today? Uh, yeah. Yes. I also saw saw you. Yeah. All also all four of them still happening. <laughs> okay. Okay. And the vision, is that an integrated vision or is that a vision for a certain sector? Uh, there is an integrated vision. Um, in Jamaica, we have what is called the Vision 2030. Yeah. The National um, Quality Guideline document that is um, aligned to the Sustainable Development Goal. Oh, wow. So it provides a vision for most sectors, not all sectors. In terms of having a vision of where we want to go, we do have that. And when we're working at, at getting to that vision, there in life is problem. That's interesting. And when is it? When was it uh, agreed upon? Uh, it would have been early 2000s. 2000? About 2004, five, or even earlier. I'm not sure the exact time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's, it's quite there. Yeah, yeah it's, it's been there for a while. Done. Yeah, and was it a specific coastal vision? Not specific to coastal. As I said, it's a multi sectoral um, document. It's actually for the entire continent. It looks at all sectors, but one of those sectors deals with the environment. And under the environment, we have achieved very good high Okay, yeah. Okay. Well, I will come back to these later uh, and also explain a bit how it evolved in Belgium and how sometimes, well, in, in the period in 99, definitely also in Belgium, there was a lack of vision. It was just no total concepts of visions present. And I think we have moved on from that, but uh, we'll come back to it at the end. Yes, please. I just wanted to add that one of the major differences in my view is that Jamaica is viewed as an entire coastal zone in terms of the size of the country. Oh, okay. And therefore, we're heavily dependent on the coastal zone. So that yeah. might have been the reason. Yeah, especially as for islands, often it's it will be all coastal. Actually, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the, Jamaica. If you would say the the distance between the coasts, how how much is that? You know, I'd say that at least I'm not sure. Okay, um, I'm, not sure. I'm glad you don't know too. I didn't know I was so, but <laughs> I'm glad <laughs> I'm glad you don't know either. <laughs> okay, but. It's a very important point that you're making for islands. It's it's still more important. Uh, it's even more important. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Eighty and two hundred. Okay. So yes, then it is 
all coastal zone, we would say. <laughs> you can still go and get your fish on the coast, even if you live in the middle of the country. You can <laughs> okay, um, let's continue the history, come a bit closer to today. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not going to pay too much attention to this, but uh, first in uh, 1994 uh, there was a resolution, so that was a question to come to a joint strategy for coastal zones. 2000 was a very important moment for the European Commission. There was a communication on integrated coastal zone management and that followed this demonstration program. So a communication is in terms of the instruments that Europe has quite important because, because it communicates to all of its European countries saying this is what we want to do. And then in 2002, so two years after that, uh, there was an ICSM recommendation. Uh, so it was a recommendation for all the countries. And the well, the pity thing is, it's only a recommendation. You could say there could have been a legislation, but a recommendation is not more than this. You could say, well, I recommend you not to eat so much chocolate, but it's only a recommendation. Or uh, <laughs> you say, this is legislation, you're only allowed one bar of chocolate a day. Uh, so, but if it's new, it's no legislation, no one is really going to take it very seriously. Uh, but in 2002, so they had this recommendation, so it was a voluntary framework for all European countries. But it did have its value, I think, and I will show you why. Um, first, I'm sorry, first some definitions, but I, I'm, some of you have also mentioned elements of definitions. Um, just to say, well, one of you has also said it was about defining coastal zones, it's about sustainable management. And also what you've just said from the Jamaican, what Rudolf just said from the Jamaican uh, example if you say it was linked to the to the sustainable development goals well that's what it said the, the definition was coastal management is to promote sustainable management and also it's a continuous process and this word process is quite important here um, important in the whole of the discussions that have been going on through through, uh, through the last years within the European context so some other words I highlighted there, um, they said that ICDEM seeks to go to look at the long term, uh, to look only also not only at uh, uh, protecting uh, the environment, but also human life and properties, uh, even to look at the enjoyment of the coastal zone and also to take into account the carrying capacity. Um, talking about the coast, one of the big issues always is what is the coast? Um, is there anyone who knows within their country what your definition of coast is exactly? Well, Jamaica, we've just heard it's the whole island is coast. <laughs> is that is that a formal definition or do you know if there is a formal definition? Uh, it's the accepted definition for manage for environmental management. An accepted de and how far does it go into the sea, do you know? Uh, no, I don't want to speak about distances because I don't have that in my head. Yeah. But in terms of generally, um, we would go as far as our territorial seas mm -hmm. in terms of because we do depend on all of that for economics. Okay. Um, so whatever management processes we we'll have will go as far as our e EEZ. Yeah. Um, but in terms of territorial seas, it would be a more direct focus. Yeah, so the coast will also be a part of the marine side, definitely. And you have to bear in mind that Jamaica is an archipelagic state, um, so we do have several islands and keys that mm -hmm. are also considered in our management. Yeah, yeah. Okay, anyone else who knows for their own country the definition of coast? Very close to the to the coast, and also if I remember, it 
also improve the atmospheric, the, the air. Okay. Yeah, it's yep. very... Uh, A broad definition, also including the, 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 the atmosphere yes. and the, the air. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and also going down into the water. <laughs> yes. Well, until the seafloor, probably. Yeah. Yeah. And can you remind me which country you're from? Algeria. Algeria, okay. Yeah. Well, it's defining the coast, well, especially for people dealing with legislation, you can talk about it for years. Some of the projects that I showed you, the demonstration project, they didn't do anything else to talk about the coastal definition for four years. So you can imagine we're not going to do this here. <laughs> but um, definitely it's, it is quite something to think about. And I'll just... Uh, Sorry, I'm just going to bring you down to the Belgian coast, but probably you've all looked up where you were flying to. But in case you don't know, uh, that's where we are, our coast in Belgium here. So that's our, what I said, our 65 kilometer or 65, some say it's 67, but it doesn't really matter, there's two kilometers. Um, so here is the Netherlands and from upwards here starts France. And of course, on the other side of the English Channel, we've got the UK. Um, so, also for our coast, you would think, well, what is the coast? Is it, well, this is how long it is, how far inland do you go? Do you cross the border with the uh, marine area? And how far do you go in this marine area? Um, well, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not a jurist and I'm not dealing so much with legal aspects, so in my type of work, we use this definition that was also an official definition uh, of, the, of the coast. And I think it defines it really well. It is the interface, so an important word, an interface between the land and sea, delineated as a part of the land, affected by its proximity to the sea, and the other way around, the part of the sea affected by its proximity to the land. So it's quite a general, but it works. And depending on the topic that we're dealing with, this definition and the area that we're looking at can be quite narrow or it could be very, very wide. If you're talking, for instance, about uh, pollution, water pollution, it could be quite go far going inland because you need to take into account uh, the, the estuary system. So you need to take this into account. But if we're talking about, um, for instance, um, a management tool for beach bars at the beach, well, my definition of the coast for that specific topic will be only the beach. And it will, might be stretching onto the, onto the protective dike, but that's it. So depending on the topic we're working with, our definition can be very, very narrow or wide. And you just adjust it. And this description uh, allows very well for that. So I've mentioned this um, recommendation on ICZM. Uh, I just put the official uh, terminology there. So in case if you want to look it up uh, later, you can have a look at it. Uh, but what did it ask to the member states of the Europe Commission, European Commission? Um, it asked for a strategic approach to coastal zone management and planning uh, based on a couple of common principles. Um, and in this recommendation, and that's why I said earlier, I think this recommendation was of some value. In this recommendation, um, they've actually oops, they've actually had eight principles for ICZM, and I'm going to put them up one by one. Um, well, first principle said we need to take a broad thematic and geographic perspective. Second one, we need a long-term perspective a sound knowledge base, we need to look at local specificity, work with national processes, involve all parties concerned, and we need to work on vertical and horizontal integration. Those are the eight ones, and I would like to put you to work with these ones for five minutes. I would like you two by two, you know, most of you are nearly positions two by two except you two could you <laughs> make a match <laughs> I would like to invite you to each of you think about one of these principles and give us an example what it could mean in you could have your own example that you've got in mind or you could take 
totally different example. So I would suggest uh, at the back there, Yasmina and, uh, well, the two Belgians, I guess, <laughs> uh, look at the first one, broad thematic and geographic perspective. So come up with an example on why this could be important and what it means. Then you two take the long-term perspective, then Rudolf and, I can't see your name, I'm sorry. Um, yes, yes. Um, then you take the sound knowledge base, uh, you two take uh, local specificity, then for you it's working with natural processes, for you it's involving all parties concerned, then for you two, I'm sorry, I'm behind this, this thing, it's in the way, <laughs> uh, uh, involving all parties, then I come to you, vertical and horizontal integration, and I come back with you for the first one, broad thematic and geographic perspective, right? Um, I would give you five minutes and just together think about a, a good example for this specific principle. Right? So just we start at the far end. Um, do you have an example where you could say, okay, this was a principle of taking a broad thematic and geographic perspective? Um, it was something about uh, the geology, where I, in my case, then. Um, that we thought that uh, the outflow of the scout from uh, sediment that is um, going from, yeah, from the river system into the, the North Sea, into the coastal area, is actually uh, geographic dependent, but it's also actually a kind of a broad thematic uh, team, actually. So the sediments that's coming from the rivers, it's actually uh, also dependent and also in the uh, part of the coastal zone near France, that the influence there is not so high, and it's in the northern part of the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the thematic influence, uh, because, because you say it's broad thematic, mm -hmm. what kind of themes are you thinking about then? Um, for instance, uh, the quantity of sediment that influence our coast, mm -hmm. so that it will be more. Uh, it will be more uh, floggy in our mm -hmm. coastal zones near the, the, the scouts than in other regions, like for instance in another country like uh, Jamaica, for instance, that there will be maybe more clear water than in a uh, region where there is a scout also with a lot of sediment. Yeah. And also that it um, influences a lot of other aspects, so in a thematic point of view, it's not only geology, it will also have an influ influence on the biology mm -hmm. and uh, also on transport, for example, yep. of the ships coming in. And out. That, was, that was a nice addition there where you have these different themes. It could be shipping, ecology, uh, sedimentation. And also, it's a very nice example that you gave uh, for this geographic perspective because it's a little bit strange. You've seen our coast and we don't have a lot of real estuaries. And like in Belgium, it's strange if we define coast, we hardly ever think about this important, it's the Schelde, so it's a big river. Um, and it's actually not on our side, but it's, it's more, on, it's on the Dutch, it's across the Dutch border, but it is very important for us. And in many countries when they have, where they have an estuary on their own coast, they take it as part of the coast. But on one, one way or the other, we don't really consider it as coast, but it is very important. So that was a very nice example. Thank you. <laughs> um, we will come to your example uh, at the end. Is that okay? We do this tour. Um, okay. Oh, yes, this was an, this was the uh, picture I was going to, to to show you. Well, there was talk about sedimentation, um, and I've showed you the sandy beaches, and not all of them are natural beaches anymore. We have a lot of uh, beach um, nourishment going on uh, in order to, to maintain our beaches. Uh, so that was, if there was not going to be a relevant uh, example, I was going to give this one, but you've gave, given a good example, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, okay, long-term perspective. Like tomorrow, you have to think about a lot of things in land of the conflict. And we thought about uh, sustainability because if you want to use the resource, to continue to use the resource in the future, you have 
to start now and continue uh, the mismanagement for a long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that's also a relevant example. Um, coming back to this coastal, well, this coastal protection, the picture that I've just shown, it's also like that. If you say we're going to have all our beaches suppletion on the beaches, in the end, where are you going to get your sand from? So you need to think in a longer term and not only on a short term solution. So that was a good one. Um, the next group. Sounds knowledge base. What's your example there? We, uh, we have an example of adaptive uh, management. Uh, 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 I think that we are uh, going to gather more information and to, to be adaptive, not to stay uh, uh, at this step, but we, uh, we should uh, learn from our mistakes and uh, gather more information and to be adaptive. Mm -hmm. It's like you know this ICDM recommendation very well because actually, normally it said sound knowledge base and adaptive management. So we, what you're saying, adaptive management is also very crucial, is to learn from your knowledge. And that's why science and scientific research and monitoring is so important for the policy makers. So, and did you think about a certain type of data or was it in general that you're speaking? that uh, uh, we should have uh, more information about different existing uh, social uh, processes, uh, different stakeholders, and uh, to, to address every activity in the post, uh, 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 because we have, uh, like my colleague said, uh, what is suitable for uh, Jamaica is not suitable for Belgium or mm -hmm. Egypt and so on. So we should address every ecosystem and every uh, environment as, as it is and to, be, to gather more information about uh, different activities, different stakeholders and uh, so on. Uh, and to address um, uh, every ecosystem as a case, as a special case. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. to be adapt uh, adaptive uh, on the management and so on. Yeah. That's, we'll come back to that in another principle, I think, uh, and then we can make the link. Um, well, there it is. <laughs> uh, the local specificity that might be applying for that, but you probably have another example. <laughs> um, we, we're taking a, it's a kind of guidelines produced by some local or uh, regional government. So, uh, in order to uh, uh, to to advise the authorities on the how to 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 appropriate use of the coastal zone. So and solution for like let's say you have a different structure of zoning. Mm -hmm. Different countries have different definition of zoning. So uh, let's say within that zone, uh, they are defining no fishermen, but the other zones just like you know, they are allowing for fishermen. So uh, it's like a specifically. Uh, defining that this is the currently situation and how can we take count in no fishermen and with fishermen kind of zones so that uh, it address uh, the solution for different zoning. Yes, according to the, the local situation, the economic situation, the carrying capacity, mm. so yeah. Localization. And the localization of, yes, and the typical characteristics of that area. Mm. So. It, it might see to those of you who work a bit longer in these fields that we are kicking in open doors. But I think still, um, I will explain it at the end, still it could be important to have these kind of principles in mind. Because I've heard some people saying, we hope to learn from this course about what ICZM is and what it can do. So I think even just thinking about it might seem logical, having these local specificities, but on the other hand, some people would say, we need a general approach for something. It doesn't work. You need to be, for instance here, you need to have this local specificity. So even those, even though with our principles, they still can be very helpful for your ICZM process. So, okay, thank you. The next one, working with natural processes and your carrying capacity. Yeah, um, we were discussing, and most of all natural processes that affect the, the coastal zone, can fall under the umbrella of um, climate change or linked to climate change, such as uh, coastal flooding, um, sargassum like in the Caribbean, 
we also have uh, hurricanes and other coastal storms that affect the coastal zone. Um, rising ocean temperatures, uh, which also is linked to algal blooming, um, sea level rise, and uh, coastal erosion. So there are a lot of things there that are linked to uh, climate change. And some of the solutions which are interconnected to uh, the other principles mentioned so far are effective protective structures, which again relate to adaptive technologies and uh, mitigative strategies. Um, building solutions, certain building solutions and settling policies, which zones you should or should not um, settle in. So, I think... It's uh, very difficult to control climate change, I think, and uh, first of all, I think uh, we should uh, decrease uh, uh, emission of uh, methane, uh, black carbon, etc., because uh, is this... Uh, greenhouse uh, gases uh, effect on uh, melting uh, Arctic and Antarctic uh, ice uh, melting. So uh, it's, I think it's very difficult to, to control ca climate change changes, but we should uh, maybe um, uh, pro propagate to policy maker, uh, reduce this uh, 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 gases and uh, maybe like this we could <laughs> affect on this but it's very uh, uh, difficult to do this mm -hmm. because I know in uh, Antarctic even one degree uh, caused on Antarctic ecosystems because uh, sea urchins uh, uh, have uh, bad fertility even if water uh, is warm at even one degree so it's very vulnerable, uh, and uh, I think it's uh, every coastal zone has uh, this uh, um, ecosystem that uh, not uh, feel very very good. Yeah, they're vulnerable yeah. to the climate change. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's that's also true. That climate change will affect the coastal areas very much. And it's funny that you take these examples from, and it's logical also that you take these examples from climate change, because now climate change is a topic that's really high on the agenda, not, not everywhere. I know, but yeah, yes. I know that uh, last 50 years uh, in Antarctica we have uh, uh, increasing temperature 1.5 degree, mm -hmm. and uh, in Arctic it's even 6 degree. Six, so, yeah. yeah, so it's very, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> very fast. It's definitely something to take into account when you say about carrying capacity of things. Um, but what, why I'm saying it's funny, because like when the recommendation was there, like 20 years ago, climate change, it, we spoke about it, but it was not no, it's so high on the agenda. So um, for now it is, but then they thought more about like... Um, and carrying capacity, also the number of fishermen, for instance, uh, depleting a fish stock, uh, or carrying capacity could also be the number of tourists that you have on a beach. That tourism management has also been mentioned in your introductions. So carrying capacity could also come down to this, or how to manage a, a human activity uh, on a natural system. Uh, and that's also why it is linked to this principle of taking natural processes into account with the impact of human activities. Okay, thank you. Um, involving all parties. Yes. So for our case, we have parties as stakeholders, and we identify three different types of stakeholders who can be involved as in the term. So for the direct stakeholders, we classify them as uh, parties who are directly dependent on the resources of the coastal area and example uh, the fishermen or the hoteliers who depend on tourism and for the indirect stakeholders we identified them as um, for example governmental organizations or non-governmental organizations who are not directly dependent on the coastal zone but are interested in managing this area and then we also have uh, the third category of the not directly involved but they are going to be affected by activities uh, which take place in these coastal zone areas, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, 
Okay, you've, you've shown a nice example that there is a, a wider range of stakeholders to involve. And that's one of the advice they always give if you start with the project. Make a stakeholder analysis. Look at your people who are there. And sometimes you can make it even yeah, more deep, but going into more detail on what influence your stakeholders have, if they have a good or bad in, um, influence, if they have a high or low interest. But in identifying your stakeholders is very important. And indeed, the parties were the stakeholders and to involve them in your process again, is one of those principles. I'll come from behind this. Yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't move too much, otherwise I'm not in the camera, so. <laughs> and because of this, you gave her the same one. Oh. one the oh, really? <laughs> OK. Well, I'm <laughs> curious to hear about your stakeholders. Then. But we just, I don't know if you mentioned it, but we have some other stakeholders. Yes. For example, uh, the Ministry of Education, they have their own Uh, we have the um, uh, marine traffic, and uh, we said we are uh, the agriculture farmer or company. So just adding some stakeholders. Yeah. You gave them the last one. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm really sorry. Okay. <laughs> no. But in military, is this something that you are dealing with in your country specifically? Yeah, uh, yes, uh, because um, uh, we, we need them, for example, we have an association, the APAN. The maps, yeah. Yeah, and it's not that the military have a lot of um, areas on the coast that they yeah, use, and yes. So if you say protected, it's not protected for nature, but protected for the military. Yes, we have protected for military, okay. and we have protected for nature. <laughs> okay. And are they together, or? No, no, no. no. Sometimes, yes. <laughs> it could be. Sometimes it's the same. It's, yes. It's, uh, uh, since it's protected for military, it's safe, because nobody will go there. That's it. There. Well, it depends what the military and does there. Know, it's. Uh, <laughs> <have those> <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but we have a zone like this where the military have a shooting range, and it's also yeah. a, a no-go zone. But it's uh... <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm coming to you for the vertical and horizontal integration. <laughs> Yes. Geographer. Um, okay. Yeah. What's the, can you explain the difference between the planner and the geographer? Okay. For me, when we talk about integration, I was more thinking about the bottom-up, for example, from local to the ministry or the national uh, yes. decision maker, and uh, and for the horizontal, for example, between ministries and uh, like uh, setting. Uh, Interministerial Commission in order to work uh, together, for example, and uh, for uh, the geographer. Yes, I thought about the, the territory itself. Is how long the boat goes on and how deep it goes to, to the uh, ground or, or to the to shell. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So how how um, it's uh, possible to integrate it in the local authorities and uh, how the um, local policy it can accept. Well, I think the explanation that you give to it is much more back to the first, uh, the first principle that was with about this geographical geographical range that was explained in the first example. So, and I think your interpretation is what was meant with this principle. If you, it's not wrong. It's just another principle. <laughs> but what you said, if they say horizontal, it is more between 
different uh, scales and authority levels. So it could be uh, the horizontal between the national, the regional, and the local level. And if they say the vertical integration, they mostly mean um, between sectors. So that tourism is talking to nature protection, is talking to uh, coastal, uh, uh, to the military. So horizontal integration is integra integration between the sectors. So, um, and would you like to share uh, an example on the first principle with us? Yes, we went exactly to the tool that we have been working on for some time, the system approach framework. But uh, it actually covers all of the recommendations. Uh, first of all, you are designing of special piece areas in different geographical locations that could have something um, in common or something totally different. But you approach them in the same stepwise uh, framework. Uh, you are going from identifying a problem to choosing the methodology to uh, making social economical analysis to making a geographical model uh, to like map every single different kind of problem but then come together with those examples and uh, also the benefit from one another. Mm -hmm. So when you're using all of these principles, um, in what way are the are you doing that? Is that if there is there? You mentioned the word framework. Is there a framework for it, or is it something else? It's a stepwise approach. It is called integrate. Uh, it is for ICCM, but you know what kind of tool that you use. Yeah. And what does the tool do? If you look at these eight principles, what does it does it tell you? Have you thought about horizontal and vertical integration, or yes, it has everything. The stakeholder and the would you call it a kind of a checklist? It's a support thing. Mm -hmm. uh, more like if to put it very simply, it's uh, a report. Mm -hmm. and you're filling every step and then yeah. you follow that you have done everything so it can be a checklist but with a lot of descriptions. Yes, yeah, with a lot of information behind your answer. Okay. Um, well, that was my next point that I was going to say. Um, is that how do you use these principles? Uh, I remember someone said I'm looking for like a big ICSM plan. Um, actually, when we were discussing about ICSM at the European level, and I don't know if it's in my next slide. Yes, it's I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Uh, but if you look at them, you could easily use them as a checklist if you have. A known project and say look I want to do it uh, in an ICSM kind of way you could easily check have I involved all my stakeholders have I got a long-term vision have I got a broad thematic approach um, have I used different instruments that I can can use so you could use it as a checklist to see if your project is is, is fitting to the ICSM principles and we've also developed it a couple of years ago as a system, as criteria actually, to hand out awards. We wanted to, um, yeah, to have a positive effect on good projects that we thought, well, they are really fitting into this ICZM way of thinking. Uh, and we developed this with just the image for it. It says the coast looks further and it says initiatives as an impulse for sustainable management on the coast. And we asked people to hand in their projects and for each of these eight criteria, like you say, describe what they had done to reach these criteria. And if they, if they met all of those, they could get an award from us, an award on sustainable coastal management. Um, and I'm going to explain why this idea of a checklist and also you could say a more, you, you described it as more like a framework or a methodology. A lot of people say that it's a process and that ICSM is no more than a process. They say it's a process of good governance. It's not a plan. It's not something that you can put on paper like a marine spatial plan or a, a local spatial plan. It is more a process that you go through. In 2013, um, the European Commission tried to go to a legislative instruments for you can see it there, marine spatial planning and integrated coastal management. You remember we had a recommendation. 
uh, a recommendation is good, but you could see that not all countries were really working on ICZM as the European Commission wanted to. So they said in 2013, let's look for, an, if we can some, make something more binding, that they are obliged to do it. So they started in 2013 this process to make a directive, and a directive is a binding instrument, you're obliged to do it in Europe. Um, but, um, I'm going to go back to this slide first, but well, after a whole lot of discussions, so, so in Europe it's discussed with all the member states if you want to have this as a directive. Uh, and the end result of more than a year of discussions was that integrated coastal management was deleted from the text and it was not to be found there anymore. And why was that? It was because some of the larger and powerful member states said integrate coastal coast management. It's only a process. Why do you need legislation for a process of good governance? It's something like we have to do. It's something like sustainable management. You don't need legislation for that. But we need legislation for marine spatial planning because that is a map with spatial plans and spatial zones drawn on it. And you cannot combine those two in one, uh, in one directive, in one legislative instrument. And so that was, that was the end conclusion where they had, when they said, OK, we don't need legislative instrument on integrated coastal management, but we do need one for the marine space. But the two come together at a certain point. Uh, in Article 7, it doesn't really matter in which article, but Article 7, if you look it up, in the MSP directive that was voted then, it says, in order to take into account the land-sea interaction, and one of you have mentioned this terminology in your introduction, land-sea interaction, the member states may use formal or informal processes, that's the word, such as ICM. So that was the compromise. We will keep it in there somewhere, Member states are not obliged to do it, but if they want to take on ICM, that's where the link is. So, and the main link now is the land-sea interaction. And we've mentioned before this definition for coastal zone. Well, there was, you, do you remember the interaction between, I don't know if I put, no, I didn't put the, the definition on again, but, you know, the part of the sea influenced by land and the part of the land influenced by the sea. And... I don't know, who, who was it of you who mentioned real, but you said it the other way around. You said sea-land interaction? You mentioned it? Yeah, I, I remember. So, and you are working with this terminology also in your work? Land-sea interaction? Yeah. So it makes total sense. <laughs> yeah, just because this wording was I Yeah. Um, so there is... It's, it's a bit strange. I think for many of you, it might seem very logical, and also from your examples, that there is an interaction between land and sea, and that we have to take this into consideration. Uh, as just one example, there was a couple of weeks ago, there was a large whale, very exceptional for our coast, a large whale floating in front of our coast. So that was a typical sea thing. But then after that, the whale was beached, it was wash, washed ashore, so it became a land thing. And then in the next step, they wanted to get rid of the animal, and no one wanted the animal because there were high costs to, to take it away from the beach. And that's a typical land-sea interaction thing. It starts at the sea and it ends on the land. But it's like that for many, many topics. And it's like that in many of your examples. We've seen the seaweed example. Uh, sea turtle example, um, but also coastal, coastal protection is one of these typical, oil pollution, uh, even harbour development. So for many of these things, the land-sea interaction is a typical thing for our coast. Uh, yeah, there's the example of um, beach litter, which we've also worked on. And oh, here it is again, my definition, you know, where we remember to make this link between land and sea, and the other way around. Um, I'm going to, well, it's, yeah, I'm going to uh,
give you a couple of conclusions of um, a conference that was organized last year uh, by the Marine Spatial Planning Platform of Europe. Um, no one really knew what to do with this uh, integration of land and sea. Um, because most of the things, it's always either the sea or either landwards. And a lot of the legislation, a lot of how we are structured in the terms of how your departments are structured, how your country is structured, it's either you're dealing with the seaside, either you're dealing with the land side. But it's very difficult to find something that's dealing with both of them. So the Marine Spatial Planning Platform organized a conference and asked uh, to uh, a lot of member states to share their uh, experience. Um, just a question also, is there, how is it in your countries? Is there someone who has the, um, an example where there's an institute who's dealing with the marine side and the land side? Or is it everywhere that it's dealing with you know, you've got a border there, you've got the coastline, and one is dealing with the water, the other is dealing with the land. Or are there examples where they do both? Jamaica? <laughs> uh, we have one agency with, with complete responsibility for the entire island, and that includes marine and... That includes and marine. And terrestrial. Yeah. So it, it, does environmental management and planning at the same time. Okay, uh, also forest. planning of the marine side. Marine and land. So it's, in, it's total environment and total planning as it relates to space. Yeah, yeah. I think we should more look at examples of the island states because we could learn from that. It's, I think for island states, and like you say, I have a lot of archipelago, it's something that you need. It's just a very logical way of thinking probably but not for countries that have just only a smaller coast or part of the coast. Yeah. You were going to add something? Uh, I, I was going to say the drawback to it, however, is that we have several other companies or agencies that have responsibility for aspects. So it's kind of messy that you have one company that does everything and then sectorial companies there's a struggle as to who has the real final say on what happens. So we still have problems in the good example. So the one that's doing the total has not got, uh, he cannot say something about the others. Uh, um, technically, from a legislative point of view, the one that has total governance has the laws um, supporting its role. However, okay. from a political standpoint, there are other companies that have a say. Okay. Yeah. And could you give some examples of those thematic, um, like you call companies or departments? Or okay. Is, um, is it like tourism? Say for, say for example, well, I work for the National Environment and Planning Agency, which is the agency with oversight. Um, but we have a fisheries department mm -hmm. that there is an overlap. Because while we will do the management of marine ecosystem, marine and coastal ecosystem, they deal with the fisheries. Itself. Yeah. So that's kind of a gray area as to who has that final decision mm -hmm. when you're talking about the habitat versus the users of the habitat. And that's one example of where one of the problems lies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. You were going to keep it going. Basins, yeah. Yeah. They have committees, so they have discussion about their planting as a whole. So probably what's happening in the head of the city will reach the, the beach, for example. So mm -hmm. they have this, this discussion in the social the society. The society, yes. Yeah. Okay. And they have uh, a group that makes discussion about the coastal management. So you have uh, several sectors, but what they say is that uh, in the meetings, not all sectors are. Uh, yes. Yeah. 
So if you remember that uh, that principle involves all parties or all stakeholders involved. So it's a major mistake to forget uh, certain, even if they are small, you need to really think about all your stakeholders and do that from the very beginning uh, in your in your process. Something, sorry, from Kenya. Uh, interesting, it's either Jamaica is copying from Kenya or Kenya is copying from Jamaica. <laughs> we also have Vision 2030. <laughs> we also have the Ministry of uh, Environment, which is the custodian of our uh, integrated custodial management policy. And we have these other departments like fisheries. Now the State Department of Fisheries and Global Economy has been given the mandate to develop MSP, but ICZM then it's under the Ministry of uh, Environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I don't know how they're going to work out. And, and that's a difficulty. If there was uh, some department or someone dealing with ICZM, very often it was under the environment. Yeah. Uh, but of course, integrated management is so much more than environment. It's it's everything, and that that is a major thing to think about. If you have an official, an official institute doing ICZM, like in in Belgium, we have no official, no one is really do no one and everyone should be doing ICZM, um, but there's no official. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just a comment here on on the policy directives and getting stakeholders involved. Um, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, which is, as I said, the other end of the Caribbean. Um, and like Jamaica, coastal zone policy and ICZM plans have been along for a long time. I actually just checked up, Rudolph, and, and your ICZM policy has been around since 2000. Yeah. So you were right, right? Mm -hmm. so, well done. <laughs> but the point of that is, um, most likely, as, as you said, those plans came around because the coastal zone is of such importance to us, right? So we developed uh, coastal zone management plans, but more from a, a, a political perspective. Now, one mm -hmm. of the problems in the Caribbean, I'm sure uh, Rudolf can, can speak to this as well, is the imp implementation and enforcement of policies. So we spend a lot of time um, working on the policy side um, from the politics and getting uh, a, a solid policy may be developed, but not much on the implementation side. And that's, for us, that's a, there are a lot of reasons that cause that, because of lack of resources for enforcement and things like that. But I think now, um, because we in Trinidad and Tobago, we have just, uh, in 2014, um, updated our ICZM strategy. It's actually up on um, the Caribbean Marine Atlas website. So we posted that document there. Um, so it's a policy with certain objectives identified and one of those updated objectives is getting more stakeholders involved in the process mm -hmm. not just in the policy development but also in the implementation side of it because oftentimes yeah. we've been hamstrung by uh, just developing a policy or a legislation but we can't get that enforced right because of resources on the political side of it but if we find um, we have stakeholder consultation, where the users themselves, more of the users involved in the education or the stakeholder meetings, and we can transfer the impact to them. Mm -hmm. They help with the enforcement themselves. Yeah. So it's not entirely political. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that was one of the issues I, I wanted to raise from earlier. Uh, what we find is during the adaptation of the policies or the enforcement, the actual process isn't followed, if you understand what I'm saying. What I'm trying to get is, you come to the public or the end users of the product at the end of a policy decision. So we'll sit at the desk internally and we'll create the policy and then we come and advise the mm -hmm. public rather than have them integrated into the planning. So what you find is at that point, when you come with this nice plan as to what you're gonna do, the end users aren't in agreement with it. Yep. And that's when you find that breakdown in actually enforcing. 
So one of the important things to do is at the planning stage or the or at least at an early stage in your year. policy yeah. um, construction, you need to get all the stakeholders, and that includes the locals and all end users of your policy in order for it to actually work. Yeah. Because what we've found is the policies that have input from locals work a little bit better, as he says, than those that are created by the intellect at mm -hmm. the desk and then sold to the public afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. I think I showed you this this impact assessment on the socioeconomic benefits of ICSM and there were a lot of examples from there where you have information from fishermen or from local people who know the situation. It can be very valuable uh, and save you costs uh, at the end of your process. And also an instrument mentioned very often uh, within um, the, the ICM is the, in, is the um, environmental impact assessment. Because within the process of environmental impact assessment, you are obliged to have this public consultation in an earlier phase. Um, well, definitely in, in the European countries, it's, but I think it's, it must be similar elsewhere, where you have from a very early stage an obligation to involve people. Uh, so that's very often mentioned as an instrument that can just support you. It's an environmental impact assessment for the coast, um, but it could apply for another uh, case study. Yes? To add to that, I think what you mentioned is what we, for example, try to do in our projects. Um, and it is definitely really important. The problem that you face in those phases, I think, is getting people excited to participate. Like there is a lack of, um, I don't, I can't come up with the word, but like um, initiative of certain uh, stakeholder groups that don't stand up to, like the events are being like publicized to everyone. Everyone has the right to come there and participate and everything. But usually when you have a meeting like that, you get the environmentalists <laughs> that are there, like the tree huggers that come and try to support your group. And it's very, very difficult to get real local communities like in those meetings and to get them to participate so i think we still have a long way of making that better mm -hmm. because i don't know what it's like in your regions but we have a lot of yeah people also with uh, less like they're less educated so they don't feel like they have the rights to speak up or to get involved and then so it's really hard to get them to participate. There are a lot of different tools out there to, to use for participation. Indeed, also of those people who are not organized in a group or who don't have this loud voice. Uh, and it's very important, like you say, not to only listen, listen to the loud, the ones shouting out loud, mm -hmm. but to everyone. Uh, there was another comment there, yes? I just want to add, uh, regarding the legislative parties, Mostly, uh, I did ask during one of the symposium for the lawmaker, is it uh, when we make a policy after an incident or before an incident? <laughs> so, let's say the, we are trying to protect an environment, uh, including the social departments and the economic values within an area. So, uh, one of the answer is we make a policy after something happened. So, Maybe let's say we lost a mangrove and no animals or people are struggling for no marine life they can harvest, then mm -hmm. they will try to protect what, mm -hmm. what left, which is a very unfortunate for marine spatial planning to move on smoothly. Yeah. It's, it's very often legislation is reactive, no, no. reacting to an incident. It could be a flood, but it could be the disappearance of a species or an oil spill. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's a very right uh, observation. Um, I just wanted to add to the present that um, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, One of the shortcomings and something that we have to look at when it comes on to stakeholder consultation for ICZM um, is the fact that some of the times these meetings are held um, in areas or spaces that are out of reach 
for the local people. Mm -hmm. So what is important is that you, you try as best as possible to meet the people where they actually live or work. Because some, what you find is a lot of knowledge is concentrated in the people with less access. Mm -hmm. um, so the locals with a lot of baseline information will not have the ability to come to a hotel. Like mm -hmm. in the Jamaican setting, it's usually a nice hotel <laughs> room, and you have to drive miles or yeah. take a public transportation, and most persons would just not come. Yeah. So that information will go by, and they'll be at home, and they'll see it on the news or hear it on the radio, and they'll be like, that won't work. Yeah. But if you had tried to like go by the beach and sit with the fishermen, yeah. or go into the fields and speak to somebody that works there, it's better to try to get the information and then you get them feeling more involved mm -hmm. yeah. and that system is more likely to work than a system, as I said, around a table with people like us. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, what you are saying now is one of the reasons why actually I am standing here from the province. So I'm from a lower authority level. Uh, some people might think that's strange. I'm not from the national authority level. But that's we are requested by the national authority to do the stakeholder participation for them because we have our office here in Ostend. We, my colleagues, so I have a team of colleagues. One of my colleagues, he knows all the fishermen. He knows where to go to if we want to know what they're thinking. We have someone working on the tourism business. We have someone, think, someone working specifically on spatial planning. So, but we know all the mayors. We know, we know the local organizations. We know the local stakeholders. And our national government is asking us could you please do this stakeholder participation for us? Because we, we, we live in Brussels and we, our offices are in Brussels and uh, we, we don't know even who to invite. So it is very important indeed to work with, uh, uh, but uh, so that's uh, maybe an important role for an intermediate, um, intermediate uh, authority level. But, well, they want to get rid of us in Belgium, of the provinces. That's an inside joke for the, for the Belgians. <laughs> they think we... <laughs> We should not be there anymore in the provinces, but I think it's still, if you have a level in between there to, to talk, like you say, know the local people and listen to the local people and have meetings here in, a, in the fisherman's cafe uh, and, or, or on the beach or whatever. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'll just move on. Um, there's a couple of more, a couple of uh, messages I wanted to uh, finish off with. Um, and the first one is integration in the mines. I, I think with you guys, we're okay in integrating things, but um, integrating, I mean integrating land and sea interaction. But still, I am sometimes very shocked with some people who have been working on the coast for a long time that they don't make this link between land and sea. Just one example, I was asked to to guide a process on making the marine spatial plan for Belgium, that was last year. And one of our chairmen, he was a professor in, at a university, I'm not going to, name, to, do, to mention his name, but he's a very well-known professor all over the world, and we, he was chairing this session, and we were talking about wind farms at sea. And one of the participants, he said, yes, but if you bring your electricity cables on land, where will you do this and what will the impact be? And the chairman, he said, we are not talking about land planning here. Please keep your mind to the sea. We're talking about windmills at sea. And I was so shocked. He's a professor, has been working for 40 years in, in coastal and marine affairs, and he didn't want to discuss this. And I was so, I was so shocked. Um, and this, th that's why I want to mention this anecdote, because so many people are still making a separation between those two. So this is an, an invitation to you in your work, um, whatever you do, always make the link between the two. And with the pictures I've put up there, uh, the one on the right hand side with this little donut shape or whatever well, shape you want to use it to name it, it's to show that our coastal municipalities, like the mayors, they always thought that, that what's happening at sea, it's not for us, we shouldn't be involved, it's, we're involved in things to do with our beaches, but not what's happening at sea. 
but until someone proposed to make a kind of an island in front of their coast, very close to the shore. And then they were like, oh, wait, this is going to come in front of my coast. Hmm, I want to have a say about this. And that's quite recent, a couple of years ago. And now this year we had our next public consultation on a marine spatial plan. And all the local mayors, they were very much awake. We didn't need a lot of processes to make them aware that there was a new spatial plan coming. They were there and they were paying attention to it. Also paying attention to windmills that where they were coming, islands where they, were, they would be coming. And so they were very active in the public consultation procedure. Um, so it's, it's another example how people, if it's happening in front of their coasts, they, they will be awake. And like the, the picture below, that was our minister for the North Sea. He was explaining about the windmills, how far, how small they would look. If, you, if they are far out in the sea, that they will only look this small when you look at them. Uh, and the people were happy he did not decide them to put them very close to the coast, what was the first plan. And then uh, another example, I'm not going to talk about this, but I'm going to show you this picture. And someone in the room will recognize what this is. <laughs> But I, I think very little other people recognize the, the lower uh, back picture. Um, in my title, I read Integration in the Maps. And um, when I saw, I forgot your name, I'm sorry, what's uh, your name? Lars. Lars. Lars yeah. When I saw Lars, his first picture, I said, look, he's doing it. But then you made it all good <laughs> in the next, following your presentation. Because this little picture, it's the our Belgian continental shelf. And this is our marine part. And if you wouldn't know where Belgium is and how it's constituted, you wouldn't know that the terrestrial part is also somewhere around there. And that's what many people do. They make maps and they only put one part on there. They don't put the marine and the land part on it. So if you look here, this was the same shape that you've seen before. But here is the land and here is the terrestrial part of your coast. So this was just to mention, I don't have another picture of his now, this was just to mention, but Lars, in the rest of your pictures, you've very nicely shown also the terrestrial part. But this is something that's very often done. You're gathering data, for instance, only on the marine side. But if you gather data, it's important to also look at not, yeah, not only economical data or biological data for the marine side, but also look at what's on the terrestrial side of it. But I've seen in many of your examples that you are looking at this, so that was very nice to see. Uh, Lars. Probably the first picture was because it was uh, MSFD. Oh, yes. It was not uh, yeah. the land port because it's not the directive, actually. Yeah, and that's the thing, the legislation. So MSFD means Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Yeah. So marine, it's only the marine part. And that's where it's a pity, but a lot of governments... Also water uh, framework directive or something. And water framework it's directive, yeah. Close to the, the coast, actually. But also the marine spatial plan, it will only show this part of the water side. It will never have what's happening on land in terms of spatial planning. And it should be so logical to link the two. But why is it not so logical? Why don't they show it? Because our the way our legislation is uh, in Belgium and in many other uh, countries, is that one department is responsible for the sea side, the other is responsible for the land side, uh, and we cannot show each uh, a map in certain legislation about the other side. So that's why this plea, if, if, if you as, are, as a researcher, or even if you're working within a government, always try to make the link between those two. If you're gathering data, if you're talking about, try and make the link to what's happening at sea and on land. Um, so, and I'm looking at the time, we should finish off here. I promise to show this slide again uh, at the end. Uh, so the lessons learned from the demonstration program. Um, I leave it for you to reflect on it. I, I think I've, I've heard very interesting elements on how it goes in your country. Um, and I must say that in Belgium, this first thing about having a vision definitely for some sectors has improved a lot and also on all the other aspects 
I think from 20 years ago, we've moved onwards a lot within Belgium of uh, having a better approach to integrated coastal management, although we don't have official legislation for it or an official institute. Um, but um, we are considered a bit as the experts on ICZM uh, because we are somewhere in between this uh, national level and local level and very active on the coast with our stakeholders. So and it might be interesting for all of you to talk about these things if it has happened in your country, if you've moved on or if you can learn from each other. I'm very sorry actually that I cannot stay um, for the rest of the week, but um, I unfortunately don't have the time. Uh, but uh, I uh, thank you for listening and I hope this was useful as an introduction for the rest of the week. Okay.